last night. After one too many, one embarrassment too many that is, Sir Nicholas Scott is dumped as Tory candidate for one of the most blue-blooded seats in England. What are the limits of acceptable behaviour by MPs? Good evening. The Conservative Association in Chelsea has defied the Prime Minister, the party chairman and a host of MPs by dumping its sitting MP Sir Nicholas Scott will not be standing as Conservative candidate at the next election. He'd sworn to give up drink, but it was too late. The damage was done. We'll be talking to two of the influential voices heard at that meeting behind tonight's closed doors. No agreement yet, but European finance ministers are thought to have come a step closer to a deal on what punishments to inflict on countries which break the rules of the single currency. How much longer can the British stick with keeping their options open? The MP who resigned his ministerial post because he thought the government's position untenable debates with Labour's leading pro-European. Rebels in Zaire say they've captured the biggest town in the east of the country and the advance storms on. But who are they, what do they want, and who benefits if they get it? Robin Denslow's there. In Bukavu, eastern Zaire, the rebels have set up their own administration as their forces continue to capture territory from President Mobutu. Their leader, a veteran revolutionary once visited by Che Guevara, tells Newsnight what he hopes to achieve. The Conservative MP Sir Nicholas Scott has lost his struggle to hang on to his seat. The constituency will now choose a new candidate for the next election. Sir Nicholas's nemesis was caused by an embarrassment at the Conservative Party conference involving the unusual use of a pavement. Sir Nicholas says he's now quit drinking, but there have been other incidents too which meant tonight's meeting on a recommendation the Tories of Kensington and Chelsea find a less colourful candidate. John Sopel's been there all evening. Um, John Sopel, how uh, convincing was this vote? Well, apparently it was very clear. I'm told the figures were 509 who thought that he had to go and 439 who were supporting him, but quite a split in the association and very bitter scenes afterwards. Uh, what do you mean by bitter scenes? Well, uh, everyone very angry. The, 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 the pro Nicholas Scott people saying it was a shameful day for the Conservative Party. A loyal MP had been thrown overboard. Apparently, one of his supporters at the meeting said, many of the nicest people I know drink too much. That's not a reason <coughs> for getting rid of him. And there were other people who said, no, he was, he'd become a shameful um, character and that he had to go. Uh, how often does a Conservative MP get deselected? This is very rare indeed. It's hard to think of ex many examples like this. David Ashby was deselected in Leicestershire after he'd lost a libel action. Then you'd have to go back to John Brown after he'd been kicked out of the Commons for three weeks for not declaring his interests back before the 92 general election. Most often it doesn't come to this. There are, there are raps across the knuckles. All sorts of MPs have faced reselection. Uh, David Mellor has, Michael Mates has, Julian Critchley has. In his, all these MPs have survived though. And that is what's so unusual about tonight. He had a drink, he apologised, he vowed to the Conservative Association that he wouldn't drink again. That didn't convince them. Do you know where Sir Nicholas is now? No, apparently he was very upset and surprised by the result. A very big turnout, most people thought that would work in his favour, and apparently I've spoken to some people afterwards who said he was uh, crestfallen at uh, having been deselected and won't be fighting the seat for the Conservatives at the next general election. John, thanks very much indeed. Well, on the face of it, the Scott Affair is about the point where wine and painkillers bring unwelcome headlines, but it's about other things too. From north and south and east and west, Tories obeyed the call. This is, after all, a place where the blue rinse has touched the soul. They don't like hearing that their MP has been found, in the words of one party source, kissing the pavement, and last month they'd reserved judgment on his explanation that it was all the fault of his painkillers. Tonight, each constituency association member had a ballot paper to vote yes or no to a helpfully worded confidence motion. Not everyone was convinced. No way am I going to vote for him. And I have said that for a long time. I said that before Bournemouth. I hate to be judgmental about it, but he's, he's rather let us down. He's a, a nice chap. And I think if everyone's entitled to have a drink occasionally. I'm hoping to get a, a fair answer for him. I hope he gets a fair deal from everybody. 
Nick Scott told them he's a changed man. I'll explain that years ago I did have a, a, a I was drinking too much, it wasn't a drink problem, but I was drinking too heavily, I think, at the time. Uh, but I've given that up now, I don't drink. He arrived armed with what he said was the support of the Prime Minister, the party chairman and over 100 MPs. There was also the endorsement of the KGB agent who'd failed to recruit him as a spy. He didn't rate Scott's capacity, for drink at least. But this was about local issues as much as anything. Last year, Kensington was welcomed into Nick Scott's old Chelsea constituency, rather as poor relations might arrive for Christmas. Thrusting Kensingtonites didn't want the old MP foisted on them. He didn't do his cause much good by an incident involving his car, a child in a pushchair, and some alleged remarks about the child's racial origins. But the constituency association voted loyally, albeit by just 26 votes, for him on the understanding he'd be a good boy. He was later convicted of drink driving. Kissing the pavement was the last straw. A letter from many of the ward chairmen said they could no longer unite behind him. Tonight's fawning motion reflected none of that anger. These are not the sort of headlines Nick Scott planned for himself when he started out in politics. But nothing can be a greater enemy of promise than to be tipped, as he once was by Time magazine in 1974, as one of the 150 people who would lead the world one day. Mrs Thatcher didn't buy that, and he spent most of her leadership in the wilderness. A jovial cove who enjoys the company of journalists and women and lunch, not necessarily in that order, he nonetheless had to apologise for misleading MPs when the government kiboshed a bill to give rights to the disabled. His own daughter called for him to be sacked. But Chelsea and Kensington isn't exactly unsophisticated. The fact that Scott was able to enlist the support of the party machine reflects its horror of more scandal. But the division is also between different types of Toryism. There are lots of people on the right, particularly the younger members in Kensington, um, who see it as a scalp, and they do quite like to, to win Sir Nicholas's scalp. So for them, the issue is not so much his behaviour or the construction that was put upon it. And as a result of that ballot, it was clear that Sir Nicholas Scott no longer commanded the com confidence of the association as a whole. He has, as a consequence, resigned as the prospective parliamentary candidate for the Kensington and Chelsea Conservative Association. I have been instructed by the special general meeting to institute forthwith a selection procedure to find a new uh, prospective parliamentary candidate. And I'm delighted that it is up because we've had so much trouble with this man that I'm glad we got rid of him now. After 30 years hard work in uh, South Paddington and then in Chelsea, uh, to have been asked not to stand again on a relatively minor matter, I think is very, very unfortunate. I don't think the Conservative Party in this constituency will be a very happy one for a very long time. While Sir Nicholas's supporters lost their man tonight, the battle is on between those different Tories to pick his successor. Well, the meeting ended about uh, 50 minutes or so ago, and two of the... Uh, Prominent voices there have joined us here in, here in the studio, Councillor Barry Phelps and uh, O.J. Williams. Uh, Mr. Phelps, what was the atmosphere like? There are always a few extremists. Uh, there were some people who were terribly bitter and rude and angry, uh, and there were some people who were absolutely cock a -hoop. You wanted but him the, to go, of course. But Who wanted him to go. But the vast majority of people... I think, felt a certain sadness that Sir Nicholas had forced us to end his career in this way. He was a marvellous Northern Ireland minister, but there were personal problems that had to be resolved and weren't. Mr Williams, is that uh, more or less your recollection of the meeting too? Well, I think the overwhelming uh, view was one of sadness on both sides and uh, not one of partisanship or triumphalism at all. It's obviously a very sad and brutal end to a distinguished career. How, um, how did Sir Nicholas speak? He spoke very well indeed, as he does invariably, and uh, he made, I think, probably the best speech of the evening. But uh, in the end, he wasn't believed. I don't think it's a question of not being believed. It's a question of uh, it not being accepted that he was the man to continue. But uh, Well, it is rather a question whether he is believed or not. I mean, if he merely had an unfortunate reaction after two glasses of wine to some painkillers, that could happen to any of us, couldn't it? Uh, it's a question 
not of Bournemouth, but of Bournemouth and Sydney Street when he was convicted of drink driving. And we reselected him after the event on the understanding that he would not disgrace himself or us again. And unfortunately, then came Bournemouth, and I'm afraid it was a mistake too much. Was there um, any way, in your view, that he could have been uh, given the benefit of the doubt? I mean, as someone the people there said, most, lots of people drink too much. He's been given the benefit of the doubt, I'm afraid, a few too many times. Um, in that case, uh, why did you choose him as a candidate only a year ago? Because we're a very loyal organization. We're very loyal people. We gave him the benefit of the doubt last November. Uh, and unfortunately, he wasn't able to control the problem. I think he was given the nomination last time because he was the best candidate out of very many people who are ex-ministers and a, a very, very strong field. It was a very strong field, uh, a plum seat. Uh, you obviously made the wrong decision. Uh, do you wish you'd given it to Michael Fallon, who was the other finalist, wasn't he? Uh, he was one of the Fallon. other finalists, I think, yes, yeah. that's right. No, I'm glad we gave it to Sir Nicholas Scott, and I'm very sorry that we've taken away from him within weeks of a general election, and I don't think it's going to do us any good whatsoever. It was seen at the time as being something of a right-left uh, contest in the party. These were two very distinct brands of Toryism, uh, Sir Nick Scott's idea of Toryism, and uh, Michael Fallon, and one or two of the other people who got through fairly far. Um, is it about that? Definitely not. Uh, I imagine my politics are closer to Sir Nicholas Scott's than most members of the association. Uh, but this is, it, this is a red herring. It was not about left and right. We've got uh, maybe a half a dozen right-wing extremists who are active, half a dozen left-wing extremists who are active, but that was not the issue. The issue was whether Sir Nicholas was going to conduct himself in an acceptable manner. What sort of person are you going to look for next time, Mr Williams? Well, someone as equally as good as Sir Nicholas Scott, and if not better, of course, I suppose. But uh, I think that would be very difficult to find, especially this close to a general election. But are you really saying you would have been quite happy for him to continue as your MP, despite the fact that he had been found uh, lying on the pavement? Well, it's a question of the circumstances in which he was found lying on the pavement. I accepted the reasons that he gave and the circumstances which he said in which it happened. And given that, then I would... Uh, uh, allow him to get, continue as a member of parliament for, for Kensington and Chelsea, given that. But 509 members of the association uh, did not accept that. And what we have to do now is to unite behind Andrew Dalton and the officers of the association as one party, one association mm -hmm. to fight the general election. And what we need in the candidate is a person who can best unite us and serve the royal borough. And that would take place when? Early next year, presumably? Literally, move on, literally ASAP. Hmm. Uh, we expect the selection process to be well underway before Christmas and to choose a candidate very early in the new year. I suppose you'd have no shortage of applicants. Uh, highly improbable. We're not only the safest seat well, in the Norman country. Norman Lamont was one of the candidates last time. He ruled him out far too early. And on, we're we? bang next door to Westminster, so no one has an <laughs> excuse for not giving us a lot of attention. All right. Thank you both very much. Thank you.